Hey, change the world. Hey, justice. We want justice now. Hey, everybody. I have a bullhorn, so I'm going to make sure that you can listen to me. Hey, we need some things to be different. You, over there, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to Preparing for Sunday, where you and I take a look together at the upcoming Sunday's scripture text. This is for Sunday, January 29th, 2023, the fourth Sunday of the season of Epiphany, Epiphany 4a. We are in lectionary year A, which finds us in Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 through 12 some of the best known uh, maybe most significant uh, verses of Matthew maybe up there for most significant of the whole Bible this Sunday's text is from Matthew because we're in year A of the lectionary and it is chapter 5 so it is the B attitudes we get the Sermon on the Mount, and the Sermon on the Mount begins with the B attitudes. And so these are very well known, very well uh, put together, very often read pieces of text uh, held to and looked to by people of many backgrounds and faiths uh, as, as a valuable piece of, of scripture. I want to remind you that this comes to you and comes to me through the Gospel of Matthew. That the Beatitudes, as they are written here, are from Matthew. They come to us in Luke and in Matthew, and these are the Matthew version. And I also want to remind you of that thing that I've said before in these Preparing for Sundays. This is Matthew 101, and so it's like foundational pieces of the book of Matthew. Matthew is the book in which the church is spoken of. It is the only book in which Jesus will talk about the church, the role of the church, and what it does. And that doesn't come for a long, till a long time later in Matthew. Those come all the way in chapters 16 and 18 in Matthew. But even here, all the way back in chapter 5, we can see that Matthew has this eye towards groups of people who are people of faith. And that is included here in this section on the Beatitudes. And to get some of the flavoring of it, you kind of have to understand uh, how Matthew views the church and how Matthew views people of faith as people called by Christ's death, by Christ's Holy Spirit, to live a life of justice for themselves. You know, if that means a bullhorn where you have to declare that you need justice for yourself, maybe. It's also about justice, probably more so for others. And so justice is a piece of how you'll be able to find the church. They have ideals, or in this sense of the Beatitudes, some sort of ethical practices, ethical living practices that you will see or know that helps mark uh, these people of faith that God is pulling aside and turning into this community called the church, and it is marked by justice, by ethical living. Uh, for us at St. Stephen, maybe this is the pantry, maybe this is open table, maybe this is trying to participate as we have in the past with bridge or, or family promise, uh, but maybe it's also uh, needing to get on uh, a bullhorn occasionally, and uh, maybe even without the bullhorn, it's talking about what we believe in, you know, Jesus is healing and caring for the poor. And these are things that become a standard by which our lives are marked and, uh, you know, by which our life as a community of people of faith is marked out for the world. If you want to know where God is in the midst of whatever thing you see going on that seems godless, the answer is God is in the people that God has called to do God's work. And if you don't see them there, it's because we're not maybe doing what we're supposed to be doing uh, as children of God, as people freed by uh, Christ's love. Uh, this is the way we live. The B attitudes are a very, 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 very central part of this. You know, here, I'll get on the bullhorn. 
uh, to tell you how important this is. These ones are important. These are some important ones. Uh, the Beatitudes are central to God's work in the world, to justice, and to God calling a group of people called the church who value justice and ethical living for their own well-being, but also perhaps more so for the ongoing well-being of others in the world. And the Beatitudes are central to this. So no matter what you read when you read this, Matthew 5, 1 through 12, do not get away from this central idea of how to live ethically. As a Lutheran, I'll say that we only live ethically by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's an important theological point I make here. The Holy Spirit strengthens us to live into the freedom that we have in Christ. We get to live as saved ones. We get to do this, and that get to is the pursuit of justice, ethical living. It's a purpose. It's something we find joy in. And the Beatitudes are really important to this, all right? So the question of the Beatitudes is often posed to them is whether they are, on the one hand, eschatological rewards for people who are good, or whether it is an eschatological reversal for people who are unfortunate. When you read through the Beatitudes, which you can pause this at any time and go grab your Bible, and I would invite you to do so, and read Matthew 5, 1 through 12. And when you read that, you can hear this importance of this community that God's making, and the the interpretation keys to the Beatitudes have almost always been, on the one hand, are these promising end times, like after we die, or once we move into eternity, or once Jesus comes back, eschatological rewards? If you behave, if you do these things, this will happen for you? This is a reward you can earn? Is that partly what's happening here? Or is this talking about uh, reversals when, when life ends or eternal life begins? For people who are unfortunate, do good people get rewarded or do people who have been beset by unfortunate things get fixed? That's the normal interpretive lenses, left or right lens, that normally gets put onto the Beatitudes. I'm going to expand to that quite a bit here in the next few minutes. And I'm going to do so mostly as it's found in this book. This is called God With Us. The Pastoral Theology of Matthew's Gospel. It is by Mark Allen Powell, and it covers really all the way to its conclusion uh, the idea that I'm about to talk to you about here and to spend some time with you. And so I'm really kind of just regurgitating for you some things from God With Us by Mark Allen Powell. Whether this is an eschatological reward, is are, are the Beatitudes promising me, John, you're a good guy. If you do some of this stuff when you get to heaven, God is going to reward you. Is that what it's talking about? Or is it talking about, hey, John, you had a sort of bad moment here, and, and, and life hasn't always gotten how you thought. When you get to heaven, God will fix what's broken. Is that what's being promised here? Uh, is it a reversal for people who do really well ethically? Uh, is it a reversal for people who just need a good luck? Uh, what is this about? Uh, the church, on the one hand, I would say Protestant, uh, works-based faith has often said this is an explanation of why you do the work you do because you're going to earn something from it. And I would say I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, the other hand would say maybe the more liberal use of the gospel would be, hey, the, the gospel is all the time trying to make better people who are poor or sick or broken. And I think that's true, but I don't think that's totally what the Beatitudes are either. I think they are about being called and living in the present, not because you're seeking some sort of reward, but because God's kingdom is found coming through people who are freed and who get to, in Christ, live ethically. So I have a little bit of a middle-of-the-road interpretation, which shouldn't shock you. My interpretations are always neither here nor there. They're always kind of both, maybe. Um, and so this is, to me, not about what you're going to earn by following the Beatitudes. Hey, if you follow these, you'll earn it. And this is not, for me about uh, God's word simply going out and telling someone who's known nothing but heartbreak that, well, when you get to heaven, God will fix heartbreak. I think it's more than both of those things. So I'm going to read for you here for a second from the fifth chapter of Matthew, and I'm going to talk to you uh, from this, uh, and this is really an idea stolen completely from God with us by Mark Allen Powell. But first, I'm going to read some of these verses. I'm going to read uh, 3 through 12. 
I'm not going to bother with one and one and two, which is sort of the framework. Jesus speaking to the disciples at the start with the Sermon on the Mount, and then this is what he says. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now again, the two common lenses for this uh, are that it's about uh, if you, once you are saved, live really well. Uh, you can earn this sort of fullness when you get to heaven. Um, maybe that's one way of viewing what this is about. Maybe the other way is to say, you know, lots of people have had broken, incomplete lives, and this is the promise that someday uh, God will bring those broken people to fullness. And I would say that while this is a little bit of what the Beatitudes are, neither tool for interpretation works or fits. Um, mourning is not good. So if you say, Hey, blessed are those who mourn, for they are going to earn. Well, you know, mourning is not a good thing. You don't do it by being a good person. Uh, there's something there that says reversal, that God will reverse uh, this when God's kingdom comes. But if you think it's all about the reversal, I'll say, you know, this talks about the peacemakers, and, and the peacemakers don't want to get reversed into being non-peacemakers, so it's not really a reversal all the time either. These are parts of it, but you can't use this tool universally. And indeed, what the Beatitudes are up to is much more significant to you as a called person of faith, a called member of the church, and who God wants you to be, than just one little tool that's going to reveal to you. They're much more in-depth than that, all right? And I want to point this out to you. You can stop this video and check my work on what I'm about to say. Uh, but most of this is coming to you from God With Us by Mark Allen Powell. Uh, I read verses 3 through 12, right? One of the things that your Bible does not do for you is point this out, but you can find it once I say it and you dig for it, right? Verses 3 through 10 are in the third person. They're in the third person, okay? So they're given in one sort of uh, voice, one sort of angle. You can check me on that, all right? So... What you get there, and the Bible does not do this very well, is something that you have to be versed in the Bible to kind of understand. Remember, another Matthew 101 uh, example. Matthew is very much steeped in Hebrewism, in Judaism, in Jewish backgrounds and faith and culture. Matthew is steeped in this. And one of the things that happens in the Old Testament uh, is poetic language, and the Beatitudes have Jesus speaking in an extremely poetic way. And if you know anything about poetry, it's that you don't ever apply one standard tool of how to interpret something like that. It's poetry, it's meant to be interpreted, and maybe a couple of the tools work at once, right? So in verses 3 through 10, uh, I want to point out that, and this follows the tradition of Hebrew poetry, and so you have to know that to get this breakdown. Hebrew poetry is based on parallelism, on saying the same thing twice, saying it one way and then saying it in a similar but a little bit different way. Similar way, they're parallel ways, and saying one thing in parallel ways, so saying it in a way that sounds like it's twice. You know, uh, it's the Bible saying, you know, the same thing, and it's like, why is it repeating itself? That's a Hebrew way of being poetic. And that is in existence here. Verses 3 through 10 are in the third person, and the Bible doesn't do this, but they break down into two stanzas. Verses 3 through 6, and then verses 7 through 10 are each a stanza. They're both in the third person, and they're parallel. They're not meant to be interpreted with the same tool on both. They're similar on the same path, not completely the same. They're Hebrew, parallel, uh, poetry, 
parallel poetry, so lots of P's there. Um, both of those sections, 3 through 6, 7 through 10, both have 36 words, which tells you, boy, these are parallel stanzas that are running next to each other, that are telling us about the fullness of God. If you want to talk about how cool God is, you say it once and then you emphasize it to really have it hit home. That's this parallelism. How powerful is God? Our God is mighty. Mighty is our God. Right? It's parallelism, and you say it twice to really drive it home. Uh, it's John as a dad saying the same thing to his kids. You know, it's parallelism, it's Hebrew poetry, this is the way it works. And this is a poet poetic piece of scripture. It's steeped in Hebrew tradition, and it is parallel. It is two stanzas. The first one is 3 through 6, the second one is 7 through 10. And they're not to be interpreted as rewards you can earn, nor are they to be interpreted as uh, reversals for people who have experienced unfortunate things. They're about how God breaks into our lives now. Rewards and reversals today, and not just some like lens we're forcing on this. And they're poetic, right? In this poetry, after the parallel verses, we get well, verses 11 and 12, which sound like they're part of the same speech, but when you look at them, even in the way your Bible prints them, they probably look a little different because, and this is important to see, the person switches. They're no longer in third person. They're now in second person. We're not now talking about a person over there, but the text swivels to start talking to a, lot of, to a person here. And you have to know that this is poetry to feel the movement of them. And when then, what do the words that make it be personal say? Blessed are you when you're revived, when you can identify. All of this has to do with when you are looking for God's help. Matthew establishes the church. It won't happen. Jesus will talk about it in six, chapter 16, chapter 18. But his whole vision is this idea of like Hebrew faith. Groups of people that are made who they are in a community by God. And to Matthew, that's what the church is. A little bit different because now you've experienced Jesus, but parallel, similar communities. And one of the important things that marks this community is justice. And that's what the Beatitudes are about. And it is saying to us that justice, being marked by the coming of God, being part of God's community, only happens where the justice is for us and through us. So who becomes blessed? has to do with the Holy Spirit freeing you, freeing me. We experience this, and then we hope that it overflows from us and that the Spirit pours into other people's lives. This is the work of God in the world through God's church, through the people God claims. And it's poetic, which makes it memorable. I started out by saying how famous the Beatitudes are. They're famous for a reason, because they're, it's a pretty, pretty way to talk about it, right? So this is uh, what's happening in Matthew 5. It is about identification with people in need. It is about making a community that sits on common ground together. There's not people working for some reward that gets them ahead. It's not a competition. We're not talking about a reversal uh, that happens to the unfortunate. We're talking about a reward, a reversal that God works for everybody that God makes God's church through God's spirit, God's death, resurrection, builds a community, and that justice is part of what we accept when we are brought into the faith, and it's part of what overflows us. It's an ethic, it's a justice that is God's font, baptismal waters that flow over and then pass us on to others. And so this is talking about how the church is made and why the church is made, and why you're a part of it. And it's telling us that the backbone of the church is common identification in our brokenness, in our need for God to help and to save us. Of course, that's the root of faith, right? So this is not something that you're looking for, steps you can follow to be rewarded in heaven. And this is not some, like, 
I'm not like, hey, I'm going to recite this poetry to you to tell you that, well, today might be bad, it's going to get better later. Blessed are you when you mourn. It'll be fine. It's not that either. It's God's literal speech that is poetic that tells all of us about our need and our identification together and that we've been set together to be cared for and to care for others, right? This is about empathy. This is about the thing that makes us human. This is about our connection to others. That is the sermon, uh, empathy, connection to others. It is going to be completely uh, an argument for that and an example of how we can do that. And it's based on what I think the Beatitudes are all about, which is third person, look, you know, people over there uh, will be taken care of. And the way that they'll be taken care of, verses 11 through 12, will pivot into second person. They will be taken care of through you, the keeper of the Beatitudes, of the great poetry of God's salvation, and the one who proclaims it. And we are together when we are together in our open and honest sort of needs and uh, honesty about who we are. The more em em empathy, we are filled with empathy for others, and we invite others to be filled with empathy for us. This is where the kingdom of God comes. This is where God's presence is made clear. That is what the Beatitudes are about. And we think because I'm saying social justice that I'm talking about bullhorns and yelling. And maybe it isn't that at all. Maybe not what I'm talking about is more bullhorning. Hello, hello, hello. Maybe what I'm talking about is listening which is a funny thing for me to talk about when I'm talking this much. Caring and honesty that for me to tell you that the only reason why I'm a pastor is because I am a broken person who is saved by God's love. The only reason why we're a community of God is because this is who we all are. And where we're our strongest is where we're open and honest about that and where we know in faith that it's God and God alone who brings life to these desolate people like myself and to these desolate places. And it's not some reversal that happens later just for, you know, the unfortunate, it's for the fortunate, the, the me, the you, the everybody, the people who have a good day, a bad day. It's God's uh, being uh, a, a God of presence that comes through a community that is built when we are honest and forthcoming about who we are. We are broken people whom God has saved. And this is what the Beatitudes are about. This is what the sermon should be about someday, about being the law properly. And uh, this is why we gather as the people of God, because the Beatitudes are well known and beautiful and they mean something to us, but also because they speak to us. They tell us who we are, and more importantly, they tell us who God knows us to be and how God cares for us and why our day Thank you for joining me for preparing for Sunday. You've just been uh, a person who has indulged in some Hebrew poetry, and I hope you uh, can see some of these sort of textual things, third person shift, the second person stanzas, with matching number of words in both uh, Hebrew parallelism, uh, eschatological. You know, I hope you can pull through all that stuff to hear that this is all just fancy talk, whether it's through a blue or not that tries to express just how great it is to be who we are and who God made us. And that through who we are, as frail as it is, God does great things. No matter whether you feel great or not today, God promises to be great and that your life is part of this kingdom that's coming. Your day, your efforts, your prayers, your care, your presence with others, matters. It's where God is, so indulge it. Stay safe. See you soon.